Are you ready to explore exciting careers in neuroscience and neurotechnologies? Then join me, your podcast host, Dr. Milena Krastenskaya, or simply Dr. K, and my amazing guests on the Neuro Careers Doing the Impossible podcast. Discover what it takes to turn the impossible into reality. Tune in now to a thrilling episode number 81. Dear Neuro Careers podcast listeners, welcome to another podcast in our Neuro Careers podcast series dedicated to exploring career opportunities in art and neurotechnologies. And today we have an amazing guest, Nino Lise Masklev, and she will share with you all the insights and also her story in merging arts with neurotech. Welcome, you know, it is a great pleasure to have you today on our podcast. Can you please tell our listeners where you are joining us from today? I'm from France and I'm based in France normally. Uh, but I'm visiting Cambridge for, for the month uh, for several uh... mm-hmm. Thank you. Can you please briefly introduce yourself and tell our listeners about your background? I like to define myself as a hybrid artist and scientist. I'm currently working as the first uh, artist in residence at Dassault System France the 3D software company. At the same time, I'm an independent researcher at the frontier of neuroscience, machine learning, and human-computer interaction. So for the past two years, I have been uh, making brain-computer interfaces, uh, such as uh, 3D visual generated from brain waves, EEG signal during sleep, or uh, brainwave music performances. Uh, we can discuss uh, more during the, the podcast. And um, regarding my background, I have a bachelor degree in uh, philosophy of technology and a master's degree in data mining from the University of Technology of Compiègne. But I would say that I have a quite atypical background because before uh, university, I was studying mostly fine arts and literature. And then I changed career to go back to uh, more scientific studies. So I've always been in between art and and, uh, science. Thank you so much. Let's start from the beginning. You started with your interest in fine arts and literature. Why were you drawn to this field and what specifically was the biggest interest for you in this area? In France, the educational system is very uh, compartmentalized. So very early on, you have to choose if you want to do art or science. And uh, I, I was first um, pushed by the school and my parents to do science. Like this was supposed to be the logical path of studies. But um, since the very young age, I, I was drawing and making small uh, visual artwork. And I, the creativity is something that is very central in my life. And I never saw this just as a pure leisure. So at the end of high school, when I was still, uh, I was studying science at that time, but I decided to quit my uh, science class in the middle of high school to do uh, fine arts and literature uh, studies. In the fine arts and literature, you, you also have the, um, the opportunity to study philosophy quite a lot, something like uh, nine hours a week. All this attracted me to this new new section, new curriculum, and um, the fact of also in art speciality, I had both uh, art theory and uh, art practice course every week. 
at the end of high school in France, we have a diploma, a baccalaureate, so like a special exam. And uh, my exam consisted in uh, making 10 artwork and present it in front of a jury and do a dissertation about the art and language. I really enjoy this kind of study. So after studying fine art and literature, I went to an engineering school. So I studied uh, computer science, following the advice of my philosophy teacher, actually, because he told me about uh, a very specific, um, a peculiar curriculum, sorry, um, entitled Humanities and Technology at the University of Technology of Compiègne in, in France. It's a very peculiar uh, engineering degree because you study both humanities, uh, philosophy of technology, for instance, and a scientific uh, major. So I chose uh, computer science. And uh, that's why I have both degrees, one in philosophy and one in computer science. There are many interesting moments and in what you said. So first, I'm very curious about how your parents felt when at school you decided that, no, I'm not taking, you know, science direction, I'm going into arts. How did they take it? I don't know if I can say that they just gave up about my, my decision because uh, at the very beginning of uh, high school, I I asked them to go straight to to art um, like there are special school where you can do just uh, art uh, in high school but they they refused that because uh, uh, it's not just my parents it's some kind of social pressure I think and in uh, in France there is this cliche that when you have good marks you have to go in science and uh, there was a uh, to say that people who study uh, humanities and arts are those who didn't uh, have enough good math to, it's very sad, huh? mindset, but it was not well seen to, to go in, in uh, art and literature section. Maybe it evolved today, but at uh, my time, it was like that. But yeah, at the, the last year of high school, I was accepted in both third year in a scientific section and uh, directly third year in art in the literature section. So it's not something about I was not enough good in math or something. I, I could uh, pursue in scientific uh, section, but uh, yeah, I just said to my parents and my teacher that uh, this is what I want to do. There is a, a very interesting difference, I think, between um, people's uh, behaviors in art and science course, like the, in their gesture and the way they sit in class, like there is really a, a huge difference that I observe in uh, both uh, section. Like in art classes, people are... I think more relaxed and the, the, like even people were hugging each other during class. They were eating food in the class and everybody seemed more happy too. I, I think there was also more open-minded person and in scientific section, I didn't feel very, it was not just bored, but I didn't feel like it was my, my place. Uh, even if I was very good in math, but there was really this competition aspect between the students. Uh, you have to be the best uh, in math. And there was uh, our math teacher was uh, also very encouraging the boys. He was really training the boys in the class to become engineers. And it, you could really feel that. And that was this... Uh, a bit weirdo, but blonde girl in the class that uh, has a very good grade in math, but I was still not taking maybe seriously because I was a girl. And uh, like there was all this, this feeling that I didn't uh, feel super good in the scientific section. There was a huge uh, gender difference huh, in the class. There was, uh, I would say... Uh, 
more like 40 percent of the class in science were were girls so this is not that bad uh, but in art section there was just three boys so this really impacted the inner atmosphere it was less it was not competitive at all it was a very very cool uh, kind of study but i was still perceived as the scientific like the mad scientist in art class so yes yeah, so always uh, in between I don't know if it answers your, your question, but... Uh... Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Very interesting. So you you felt like you belonged more to the arts internally. Yes, it, you felt more relaxed. You liked the atmosphere. Uh, but nevertheless, you still were perceived as a scientist. Yes? Yeah, yeah. So even when I was in art section... I felt better in terms of uh, just uh, well-being in general, but uh, in terms of interest and what I like to, yes, to study, to do, um, there was still some dimension lacking. Like, of course, I like to make uh, artworks, but I think uh, what I like in art is really this art and science intersection. I like to make... Uh, well, that's also why I I started to make BCI based uh, artwork because uh, through my art I also like to pursue uh, scientific research in some way and my art is not purely oriented toward uh, just aesthetic uh, aspect like there is also the conceptual uh, aspect dimension that often relates to scientific concept. Yeah, so even in in art section, uh, I felt the, the need to, to go back to a scientific study, but not purely scientific. So that's why I chose this dual uh, degree in philosophy and uh, computer science at the uh, University of Technology of Compiègne. And this was a very selective uh, curriculum. We, we were a class of uh, just something like 20% from different backgrounds. Uh, the specificity of this school is that they, this curriculum hosts people from different backgrounds, such as uh, find out like me. And this is very different from the other engineering school in France. This was the only engineering school in France that uh, accepts people from find out literature background. So this was really a good opportunity for me. And um, throughout my uh, university uh, years, I continued to practice art. I made several art installations that were exhibited uh, in uh, in Paris during my my studies. So this was not just a leisure for me. I, I try as much as possible to uh, continue to create, to make art installation, mostly uh, interactive installation, while studying. Uh, computer science and the study of uh, coding, uh, also even uh, philosophy and uh, experimental psychology um, inform my uh, vision of art, but also just the coding skills helped me a lot to make interactive uh, artwork. Yeah, I've uh, a lot about this, huh? um, I think that Knowing uh, the technology, knowing how to, let's say, uh, develop a neural network or to train your own model, it gives you new idea about uh, artwork that you can do with artificial intelligence. This, to me, is very different than just using an API and uh, uh, like a black box and not knowing what is behind the neural network. I'm really convinced that knowing how the technology works, so studying artificial intelligence to make a proper visit, not just for that, but I, I use a lot of machine learning model in, in my art, but I know how those tools work. So this gave me idea for artwork. Yeah. Maybe you can give us an example of one of the installations you've made that was inspired by machine learning, just to provide our listeners a perspective. 
So recently, I was inspired by this convergence toward natural language uh, systems to interact with generative AI model. This inspired me to make BCI to generate visual, but from text font. I was trying to, uh, for example, um, classify uh, EEG signal to, to deduce uh, emotional state or like emotional labels. Or even later on, uh, we tried to deduce object concept from EEG signal. So the idea was really to leverage text font, like to, to have uh, text entities to pass it to a, a generative model that takes a prompt as an input. So this is an example of how the machine learning model shaped the idea of the artwork. Like because we have a model that takes a prompt as an input, I try to uh, find a way to extract semantic categories from EEG signal to pass it like a sort of end-to-end -end, uh, process, a very seamless process where the, from the brain wave, uh, I will extract language, natural language category and pass it to a, a machine learning model. And um, I was interested in this interaction uh, with the text as a medium, you know, between brain wave and machine learning models, because uh, in this way, I like to imagine the training data set of the, let's say, uh, diffusion models as a sort of a collective memory of all the humanity because they are actually trained on a data set. Most of the time collected from the internet or the, da the data that people left on internet. Uh, we don't discuss uh, the political aspect of it, but I like this idea of dialogue between the interpretation of the machine, mo mo machine learning model trained on all the history, or not all, but a big part of the collective memory and the brain wave of an individual. Uh, that's also uh, when I generate dreams uh, painting from the EG signal, or more recently with Taya, we did the um, hypnagogic landscape in 3D, so um, we generate a landscape um, when people just fall asleep uh, in 3D. Using a um, generative model provided with uh, EEG signal uh, as an input, in this way, the machine learning models uh, occupy a bit the function like a only a role critic, like an interpreter of dreams. So the, the generative model, when you give it text prompt, it doesn't uh, reconstruct, like this is an artwork. So the goal is not to reconstruct uh, perfectly the dream, uh, but it's the machine learning model that provides an interpretation of this dream. Yeah, and this is a bit speculative artwork, but uh, I like this, this dialogue. Uh, and this is the difference with uh, just a scientific project where you, you want the, to leverage machine learning to reconstruct perfectly the, the dream or uh, my idea was using the AI to provide this sort of interpretation of, of the dream, like just a, a co-creativity between the human and the artificial intelligence. Yes, thank you so much. What I think art is doing here for you, uh, helping you expand the boundary. So you are not bound just by uh, limits of science that you need to provide the correct inter interpretation, if interpretation is even possible, uh, looking from scientific point of view. Yes, probably <laughs> even not, yes. But as an art project, as an exploration of idea, it definitely has place to be. And that component of art that provides you with opportunities for explorations in a way, which of course is uh, wonderful. Have you explored or have you provided the opportunity for this art during exhibitions that people would be able to explore these art concepts as well? But this year, the, the hypnagogic landscape in 3D were exhibited in a virtual gallery as part of the Creativity and Cognition Conference. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, and otherwise, uh, I've been doing, um, I've done two brainwave music performances this year at the Dutch's Museum and also at the Copernicus Center for the Tay Conference. Tom Gibol and Bodai did on the dead interaction. So in that case, it's not the the public was not uh, wearing the BCI, um, but uh, they were experiencing um, the whole uh, performance generated from brain waves. Yes, yes. Thank you. And how did you become interested in BCIs, in neurotechnology? So we know that you were studying arts and uh, technology at this unique program in France. And uh, how did you find information about BCIs? How did you get into that field? I think the first step was my my interest in cognitive science. When I was in high school, one of my favorite books was Godel Schnarbach from uh, Douglas Hofstadter, and just um, studying the analogies between art and science in his book. Um, one of his points was uh, showing that analogy structure the the mind uh, by this kind of art and science analogy. So for a very long time, I had this interest in uh, just uh, studying how the mind work. Uh, so it was not specific to BCI, it was just cognitive science. And then my first job after uh, university was studying the psychology of music. So I've done uh, experimental uh, psychology experiments. It was still not BCI. I tried to explain how I slowly uh, shifted from psychology to neuroscience. <laughs> so yes, I, I psychology experiments about music. And then I was involved in the uh, art and science postgraduate program at uh, Paris-Saclay University where I developed my first uh, brain-computer interface. So it was not a BCI uh, specific program, uh, but there was one class on skin electronics and we had to do a a project involving uh, electronics on skin. So my first idea was to make a BCI for that. I actually tried to make my own, uh, try to build a (laughs) low-cost EEG. So of course it was not uh, scientifically uh, accurate at all, but I experimented uh, trying to make a small uh, PCB uh, circuit of um, the EEG and uh, with the amplifier, etc. And um, I also tried to make my own uh, electro, like I tried different strategy, like molding uh, the silver. I tried uh, several things. But then I gave up this idea of building my own EEG. Because at that time, uh, EEG was uh, not so affordable. So that's why I was really motivated to build the lowest cost EEG. Uh, but then I found that uh, there is this Star Wars toy for kids uh, that is based on the, the same ship as uh, NeuroSky uh, EEG. Do you, do you know this? Uh, is the first trainer uh, tower toy that you can buy on uh, on uh, eBay for uh, twenty or thirty dollars. So I saw that maybe this is the the best idea just to start with BCI. So I got this um, this toy. I I opened it. I hacked it. So I I sold the uh, wire to snip the data from it, and that's how I. I made my first PCI, so I used this toy to generate some uh, big block with <laughs> with my uh, for for a spectral density bound that I send it to the computer. Then um, during this postgraduate program, I continue uh, developing BCI. So I still relying on this chip. I uh, embedded this chip into a three D printed uh, mask. That looks a bit like a masquerade mask. I don't know if you have seen it, but um, where I uh, translate the emotional state into uh, light, colorful light and animation 
But to be more specific, it's mostly uh, Arusa level and uh, also information about our spectral density. But this is just a one channel uh, on the frontal lobe, so I can't do uh, advanced signal processing. I mean, or deep learning on just a one channel, or at least the the level of information about emotion is not uh, really advanced. But at the end of this postgraduate program, this this mass made me uh, how to say this. I got many interviews, many interviews about this mask. Uh, I start to be uh, even my university uh, made a video about me wearing this mask. It uh, was uh, one year ago, and uh, I was contacted by several companies, BCI uh, startup. Um, they were interested by my expertise about BCI. Well, I, I was just uh, self-taught about BCI. I also read the theory about that. I just, I'm not just a soldier wires. I also read the actual uh, neuroscience uh, handbook to, to learn. Uh, I've done quite a lot of signal processing uh, for music and I reuse really some uh, knowledge that I learned about signal processing for music to, uh, EEG signal processing. Uh, some concept can be uh, transferred from one domain to another. Yeah, so that's how my journey in BCI started. I, um, after uh, this uh, art and science program, I, I work in a neurotech startup, uh, which was focusing on music recommender system from biosignals. So for this, I developed uh, emotion recognition model. Uh, uh, with more channel than one channel, but uh, that's how I, yes, I learned uh, myself, trained also myself on that a lot. So after this uh, job in the startup, I started the um, artistic residency at the Asus system, and they provided me uh, with this eight channel uh, EEG from the uh, GTEC, the, the Unicorn, and this became my main. Uh, Art and science tool. I even sleep with it. <laughs> <laughs> Not every day, but I did experiment uh, sleeping with it, uh, with Taya also. Um. Yes, yes. So very, very interesting. And I think very important for our listeners, for those who are asking how to get into a field of uh, neurotech, of brain-computer interfaces. So what you show that if you have a creative approach and you have foundations, you can uh, create your own project. Yes, you can create something on your own, and you were actually very creative in creating this project. Yes, you found some, you know, some toy uh, basically that you remodeled, that you hacked, that you put into very interesting mask. You had this idea, and this work gained attention. And you even didn't need to apply for jobs. People were approaching you, yes, and offering you jobs. So that's what you said. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How did you feel? So what, what was going on in your mind when this happened? Mm -hmm. Now I feel a bit overwhelmed, not just about the, the job offer, but also um, I was contacted by strangers, uh, strangers on a regular basis where people just were interested by my work or they asked to, to collaborate with me. And sometimes I don't want to sound uh, pretentious or anything, but I had not the time to answer all the, some messages. And uh, maybe in the past, I used to want to collaborate with people, but when everybody comes to you to ask you for collaboration, I started to maybe choose more wisely the, the person with who I want to collaborate. Of course, I was very happy. Um, I wouldn't say that this made me sad. Um, no, I think I developed more self-confidence also uh, on uh, yeah, my ability to make BCI. And I think you don't need to, like sometimes just uh, by practice, uh, you, you get some intuition about how, how things work. Um, when I do my brainwave music performance, I in a way, intuitively develop some kind of uh, neurofeedback process because I learned to, to modulate my alpha band and beta band uh, um, 
with the music as a uh, auditory uh, feedback on my uh, brain state. And I did that completely intuitively without, uh, I have not at that time read uh, that much literature on uh, neurofeedback. It's just I wanted to make a music performance that is a representation of my state of mind that I externalized through the music and it gave me a feedback and I modulate this in return. Yes, yeah, so for, for those who want to get involved in uh, BCI, uh, if the limitation is the cost of the EEG, uh, start with a, with a toy. They are, oh, they are very cheap uh, EEG, uh, one or two channels that you can find. Uh, and also the community aspect of BCI, there are a lot of uh, events like Hackathon or, or also... YouTube channel, like all the, the BCI guys, there are plenty of, uh, something that helped me a lot to start with BCI is that there were a lot of uh, tutorials on the internet to, to learn uh, at your own pace. For instance, the, the MNE uh, Python library is very well documented. Uh, there are tutorials from uh, Neuro Techniques, um, and even the training during the BCI school, uh, spring school, um, uh, also for, for the theory also, yeah, the conference. Yes, absolutely. And what I see that uh, throughout your journey, even you are working, you know, for one company, for another company, you still uh, prioritize your project. So it's still your project that is going on that you are implementing, yes, in different ways. So uh, what do you think is important? importance to have your own idea, your own project in uh, building your career? I, I worked in a big company where the, or the, the concept maker, I worked at Desert Research, uh, for instance, so I was provided with tasks and that I had to do. Um, then uh, when I worked for startup, I think uh, I would prefer more easier to work for a big company. I think my work, uh, I can see uh, maybe the, there is a lot of investment in research. So for me, there is an interest to work in a in big company. But when I work for startup, I would prefer to maybe implement my own idea into a startup than working for someone else. Yes, I think... When you can implement at scale your idea, it's better to do this. And um, for me, working in neurotech startup, since BCI is a field that is very um, cutting edge and uh, there are still a lot of research to do about this, like it's, I think there is really a lot of things to invent with BCI. Uh, contrary to, I'm very interested, VR is interesting, but I think it has reached a uh, maturity uh, a more mature field compared to BCI. I think BCI, there's still a lot of use to invent. But this is my opinion. So as a consequence, there are a lot of startups on BCI. There are many um, opportunities to get um, training uh, in startup for BCI. But on the long term, yes, I, I think uh, I would prefer to make my own BCI as an independent researcher or creating my my startup. I don't know if it answers really your question about what is most important for me. Probably, uh, yes, to implement my ideas, especially, yes, uh, in the field of BCI. I think there is a lot to invent. So that's what I would uh, prioritize and um, really reinvent. I think that the future of human-computer interaction lies in... Uh, the, the intersection of deep learning and uh, BCI. There is really, um, if you see the advancement uh, in the recent year, I think the revolution that we witness with a uh, diffusion model or generative uh, image that uh, become uh, hyper photorealistic, I think there is uh, another revolution that will happen uh, probably in the next uh, 10, maybe 20 years. Uh, when we will have consumer-grade BCI that we can non-invasive that allow for uh, 
either uh, language decoding or visual uh, reconstruction from from brainwave. There, currently, if you look at the state of the art of research, there is a growing uh, body of work on um, on language decoding and uh, visual reconstruction. Most of the work has been done with invasive uh, BCI, but uh, it's it started to be, uh, there are several papers on actually non-invasive, uh, uh, the, there is a paper on non-invasive uh, language decoding, but it's, they are not all uh, on EEG or it's either a very high resolution EEG. Last year there was a paper from uh, Jean-Louis King, uh, there are very interesting paper about language decoding. And uh, yeah, so there are plenty of interesting concept to, to develop uh, for the future of human interaction with such uh, advancement. Like once we reach a stable uh, consumer grade technology about that, uh, the, I think the, yeah, the, the future of human uh, AI interaction will be completely uh, reshaped. Mm. Mm -hmm. So how do you see it different from now? Uh, let's say we are 20 years from now. Yes, it will be year 2043. And we are meeting to discuss, you know, what do we see in BCI and remembering what it was right now. So what main changes do you expect to see? How this field will look like? How this interaction will look like? I will answer maybe specifically to the field of creativity and art. Uh, actually, I, yes. because yes. I wrote a paper about uh, not just BCI, but what I, um, about uh, human AI interaction in the specific case of uh, mm -hmm. creativity. It, it is entitled uh, Symbiotic Co-Creation uh, with AI. Uh, I wrote this paper this year and I presented it at the uh, ICML uh, workshop. In this paper, I describe what I think would be the future of uh, BCI uh, AI uh, interaction. I believe, <laughs> maybe we'll see in 20 years, uh, it would be wrong, but all this uh, natural language based uh, interface uh, to interact with generative AI, such so as text to image, text to text, text to audio, etc. I think uh, in the future, we will replace those prompts with uh, either a language decoded from non-invasive BCI or uh, for the, you know, also to image model or image imp input. This we could replace with a reconstructed visual um, for the moment, the, the, the biggest body of work is on uh, perception reconstruction, but we could also have uh, imagination reconstruction. There, there are some papers about this uh, from non-invasive BCRI, and we could use this as an input to a um, generative model uh, for creativity. In the case of creativity, you can imagine painting, uh, a visual a concept, anything, and I will uh, use uh, a BCI to extract, to externalize this concept either as text or directly as a reconstructed uh, image in uh, visual. For sure, th this can be very useful for creativity, um, but we can think about all kinds of uses for other fields than just art. Just the fact of externalizing, uh, uh, decoding language, Reconstructed imagination, also decoding uh, motor activity could be on a daily basis. Yes, you could uh, control remotely um, with PCI, but I, I think more broadly about uh, maybe more a biosignal based um, interaction with AI system. So not just all focus on on uh, brainwave, but brainwave in conjunction with maybe EDA or other. Uh, Currently, when I do brainwave music performance, I try to modulate the music with my emotional state. But to get a more accurate, I think uh, we need the EEG, but uh, a wide range of sounds, so maybe to 
to get a sort of biological selfie of the person. This could be used to personalize. In that case of creativity, I could listen to a music and inform this music with my emotion. Or I could watch a movie and as I watched it, it is shaped by my emotional state that is deduced my biosignals. In the long term uh, future, and this is a project I would like to re reconstruct or partially reconstruct uh, the dreams in uh, virtual reality so that you could uh, use the um, replay uh, your, your dreams uh, in 3D in uh, maybe VR headset. I'm more into augmented reality, but uh, this uh, maybe would be appropriate with VR. Maybe this idea sounds a bit uh, idea of a math scientist, but when you look at the progress of uh, deep learning, especially uh, self-supervised learning, uh, they are really promising results. And we witnessed how fast the generative uh, text-to-image develops. In one year or two, two years, it became, it really changed the, uh, when you look at the, the first generation of GANs and you look at now the result of different models, if we have this um, exponential uh, development with a uh, BCI uh, reconstruction, if this happened, um, I don't think this kind of proposal and idea are that crazy, honestly. Because uh, today, we, the state of the art, I think, reconstruction model, uh, reconstruction of visual, perception or imagination uh, use a different model. I think it's just a matter of, of time that we manage to uh, properly uh, reconstruct imagination from uh, brainwave activity. Um, and it will start with probably very high resolution EEG. And then there are uh, several models to uh, maybe compress a model or to, to reduce the number of electrodes so that you can reach uh, consumer grade uh, technology. The challenge is that huh, because we can uh, currently decode uh, language from brainwave activity um, or with invasive technology. Um, we just need to reproduce this result on very high resolution uh, non-invasive and then progressively find an optimal number of electrodes and compress them what they are uh, Maybe some easy said like that, but it would take uh, probably uh, 10 years maybe to reach this uh, widespread technology. Yeah. Yeah, and, and this is amazing. If you would uh, be able to summarize, what is missing uh, still for us to reach that state when we can uh, really create images, 3D images based on our imagination, you have this consumer grade uh, BCI that would allow us to do that and also visualize dreams. What would be those points that we're still missing from maybe technological perspective, uh, uh, you know, software, hardware development? And there are several aspects. I think there is an aspect of social accept acceptability of the technology. To make it really uh, like a social phenomenon, so something that really, uh, like, I, I don't know um, when people will accept to wear PCI in the street, for example. And this uh, involve a constraint about the design of BCI, like maybe we can just create BCI, but the electrodes are located in existing wearables. So, cap, headphones, so it constrains the position of the electrodes, mm -hmm. so it constrains what we can, get, which data we can get. So, so far, a uh, lot of BCI are, are developed with electrodes here or typical or the frontal law. This could be uh, integrated on a daily basis, yes, in, in existing wearables, like the cap. Um, so yeah, first, first one is social acceptability. Um, that's also why I think I don't want to disappoint so, some of the <laughs> listeners, but I believe more in non-invasive BCI than invasive. Because just in terms of social acceptability, I think it is a... Uh, safer 
but uh, safe is also based on non-invasive one. Um, for a consumer great technology, because for research, uh, um, uh, for sure, uh, we can learn more about the brain with invasive one. Right now, we don't have a seamless, a fluid um, pipeline, end to end process that take the brain wave and output uh, your dreams or your, <laughs> your imagination. So, for this, we need uh, this is just about better models, uh, machine learning based, uh, probably self supervised learning. So, we need to learn better representation of the human brain, uh, basically. Uh, we need the board to decode the... Uh, because recently, the, uh, several papers were uh, published showing that providing a font, uh, um, a category label to the diffusion model when reconstructing the visual, it uh, enhances the reconstruction. So not only we need a model to reconstruct, we need also a model to classify the the concept and the semantic element from the brain mapping. And those two combined, um, I believe, uh, could help to, to reach this, um, this seamless uh, reconstruction from the brain that you can use as a, as a prompt to a generative model. So for this, this is just a, time, a matter of time uh, to reach a uh, proper uh, Perform. It's all about performance and efficient model. And uh, this is not very really creative. Huh? Sorry for this <laughs> answer, but I think also in the human computer interaction community, there are not that much people who think the, this future of interaction, because since the technology doesn't exist yet, there are not a lot of thinkers of the future of when we will have this kind of BCI, uh, very um, efficient, uh, I think right now we could already uh, think about which kind of interface we could build there uh, with this. What else is lacking? Uh, well, I think it's already a lot. Huh? Social acceptability and uh, efficient enough uh, model. I'm confident that with time it, it will be a uh, result, honestly. Regarding art, I think um, having such kind of idea is also, uh, I know these ideas sound a bit like mad scientists, but I think uh, looking at work from artists, uh, I, I think, for example, of uh, Pierre Huyghe, who, who did, uh, I don't remember how many years ago, but he did uh, uh, an artwork with brain waves. It was a uh, Imagination constructed from brain waves, probably invasive, I'm not sure, maybe not even invasive, uh, with a gun, maybe 2018. So there are the fact of imagine, imagining uh, the future of uh, BCI, I think, but through artwork, sometimes uh, you can get an intuition about scientific discovery. I really yes, think that through artwork and through art and science collaboration, uh, some idea of future in invention and scientific discovery can uh, emerge. And uh, I really encourage uh, engineers to more about uh, artwork or to imagine uh, which artwork can we make with, uh, with BCI to rethink scientific research. And this is really a, a dialogue, I think, to involve. Mm. Mm -hmm. Where do you see the opportunities for people who are merging those two fields, uh, BCIs and arts? Opportunities in terms of uh, careers, opportunities in terms of work. There are not that much more players that are interdisciplinary, to be honest, and that's also a... Uh, um, Part of my own uh, career issue, uh, I would say. Uh, that's also why I work as an independent researcher. But there are places in the world uh, that that does uh, art and science uh, research. For for instance, I have a 
Um, my, I have a mentor at the MIT Media Lab uh, in Cambridge. This is an example of place uh, where um, uh, there are researchers that does both uh, artistic performance and uh, uh, machine learning research. In France, there are also research lab that does, uh, there is the Francy uh, lab uh, where I am at the 3D experience lab. I, I got uh, foundings to, to make, uh, not to fund my research, but my artwork that in a way inform my research. So there are some, there is some hope, <laughs> but in the case that you don't find, you know, the, the ideal uh, interdisciplinary place, uh, what I, what I learn is that you have to trace your own uh, path in a way. Like I am not creating the research lab, but I think uh, the more initiative uh, like that create art in science uh, uh, lab, alternative place. Uh, in in Paris, there are lots of fab labs that are created uh, around uh, interdisciplinary uh, exchange. So yeah, there's there's some place. Yeah. Do you see the number of places for this interdisciplinary work growing in the future as both the field of BCIs and art are merging more and developing? And maybe where do you see those possibilities of this interdisciplinary work? I think, yes, there is a growing number of opportunities for art and science. So, uh, example, I know mostly uh, institution based in France. So, but uh, for example, this year in uh, in Polytechnic, there is a new uh, there is a new department that was created um, uh, called the Spiral, and is it, it is intended at art and science collaboration. So the the it really very, very talented researcher from machine learning for audio field, but also 3D, uh, video games, um, and also art, uh, dance in the same lab. It just started this year, uh, a few months ago, uh, actually. In Europe, there is also, um, uh, I think, Arce Electronica Festival uh, is uh, in Arce Electronica Future Lab, art places where uh, you can do artwork that's leveraged very high uh, cutting edge uh, technology and BCI. So I was about to say that all the examples are mostly artistic please, but it's not true in Polytechnic. It's, it's an actual uh, very good uh, research lab. Yes, there is the Media Lab in Cambridge. Uh, the, um, I don't know, I think I repeat a bit. Uh, the same thing, but um, yes, I, I hope there will be more uh, place like that created uh, throughout the world. The, there is the pro the postgraduate program that I did uh, called Fab Academy, uh, and it's a distributed program uh, all around the world. About uh, so it's not BCI, but it's uh, electronics and uh, fashion design. So this is where I learned to do skin electronic, uh, e textile, soft robotic biomaterials. There is also the program uh, Fab Academy. Uh, so it's really the model of taken from the, the MIT, the, the Center for Bits and Atoms. So Neil Gershenfeld, uh, Fab Lab are often place where the knowledge exchange, the, the knowledge interdisciplinary knowledge uh, is exchanged. Um, yeah, I think it's more the academic scholar side that is not yet widespread, this art and science research. But there are a few examples in France, yes, Polytechnic, uh, the Sacre PhD program in uh, France. So it's an art and science uh, PhD, but the new kind of PhD in France. Yeah. It's very good to see that those programs are emerging in interdisciplinary collaboration between arts and science. And this brings me back to 
uh, what you told about the school, about the separation at the very early age, you chose art or you chose science. How you personally would like to see this school maybe changing to bring a new perspective, uh, to bring more opportunities for people experience both? Or, or do you think it's, it's okay maybe, you know, to have this separation? How, how do you look at that? I don't know, for sure. Yeah, for sure, I would change, <laughs> I would change the educational system. Um, I know that uh, right now it, it, it is a bit different uh, because uh, the French uh, president uh, changed a bit, the, uh, completely changed the educational program. But in my ideal uh, high school, there will still be um, like a set of basic knowledge that you have to study at least until the end of high school. For, for example, uh, mathematics. Even if you don't want to become a computer engineer or, or do a scientific job, I think you should continue to study mathematics at least until the end of high school, while in fine art and literature, you don't. This is what I did after one year in, in mathematics. I quit to go in fine art and literature section. And since I choose art as my specialty, I have no math course the last year of high school which i found completely uh <laughs> you know I, I think it's important to study math because i really believe that it shaped the mind maybe in a rational way uh, to, to learn how to to make a logical uh, deduction a mathematical uh, demonstration it really shaped, shaped the mind and i think it's it was good even for mental health be able to make math proof. <laughs> um, so yes, math is important. First of all, uh, I will also add a lot of philosophy. I think it's very important and not just uh, in science uh, speciality, they just have one or two hour, one hour of philosophy per week. I think we should have more. <laughs> yeah, I think minimum, uh, Minimum five hours of philosophy per week. It won't arm people to <laughs> help them to 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 force them to read philosophical book. Honestly, I think it's it would be good for humanity if we if we read more um, philosophy. Yes, let let the students have the choice to yeah, to have the the let's say the fine art speciality or the music speciality or literature like. To me, the, the most important thing to change is being able to have a, an interdisciplinary uh, curriculum of, from high school, even maybe earlier. Um, like the, the, the dream for me would be really to have <clears throat> as much mathematics, as art, as philosophy. Like that would be the, the, the dream. We're talking about high school, so I don't know if I would study uh, teach uh, neuroscience at high school <laughs> students. Like maybe through philosophy, they could get an introduction to cognitive science, I think, or psychology concept. But actually in, in uh, my philosophy class, I had an introduction to the in the con consciousness and uh, in conscious. So yeah, there, there could be an introduction. Yeah, that, that's how I, I see it. And then for the, for university, I think the model of what I, uh, the humanities and technology curriculum, so the name of this dual uh, degree that I, that I did, um, uh, is really an, an example of a type of study that I think, uh, should be, uh, generalized <laughs> more in university because it, it's really, um, in my university, people could really choose, uh, the course that they wanted the, there was a, a set of course that were mandatory, such as math again, and a few uh, computer science class um, when you choose the computer science degree. But if I wanted to study, I had a course, for example, uh, it was titled Phenomenology of Temporal Objects. Like 
Toi, tu philosophie, ou cinéma, musique, it was all about phénoménologie, uh, of uh, yes, uh, cinéma, and uh, was very interesting. And this is a course that I just chose because I was interested in this topic. And uh, I could study in this, and at the same time, uh, going to, to learn C++. <laughs> So this, I think, is a model uh, uh, educational uh, program that uh, gives a lot, give a lot of freedom to students, to students to shape their their career, their future career. But the missing thing in uh, my university was there were no science schools in my university. That's why also we took some time <laughs> probably to get in the field. There, there was experimental psychology course. There was cognitive science, but they were not um, actually uh, in neuroscience course. Yeah. So uh, what would you say was the most challenging part, carving your own interdisciplinary course in your career? When I started university, I lack mathematics knowledge because I, I spent one year, uh, the last year of high school, without uh, without studying mathematics. So my first year of university, I didn't know what logarithm was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, <laughs> and you are, when you are studying, uh, I don't know, like complexity or like things. I didn't know what was even a, a logarithm. So that was, uh, I had to catch up on um, this, but I wouldn't say this was the, the biggest uh, uh, problem issue of burden in my career regarding uh, interdisciplinarity, I think. And still today, it's uh, maybe difficult to, like people uh, perceive you are, as not being enough serious, maybe not doing enough serious research, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially uh, when I go in a machine learning conference, I feel a bit like an like an ovni, like an alien. <laughs> I would say there are some engineering fields that are very, uh, that still have this cliche uh, vision that if you go out of the, the norm a bit, uh, it's not well perceived. It is true in computer science and it's even, maybe even worse in mechanical engineering, I think. So to me, as a woman who does art and science, I can see people uh, looking at me like I'm disturbing a bit their set of uh, <laughs> assumptions about what should be a proper job and uh, what is serious research. That's also why it's uh, maybe it's easier when you do a project to be accepted in the field of human computer interaction because interactive artwork can be seen as interface, basically. So it's easier to be accepted in this field compared to machine learning uh, field. That uh, is in comparison because this year I've, I've been both to to Pi Conference, so the, the top venue for HCI, and I've been to ICML also, and um, I also been to TAY, which is also com human computer interaction. And the HCI conference are way more advanced in terms of interdisciplinarity. Like, um, they already, uh, accept and the, the paper that are accepted in this conference are really open to different kind of background. I really see like there, uh, at day there was an opera singer who did a, a conference, uh, at, uh, at Kai, the, but there are also alternative to right now, but mm -hmm. <laughs> there was a conference about, uh, don't, Structure as a Dungeon and Dragon uh, game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like they are, they are a bit, uh, yeah, they are unusual uh, kind of conference. While in machine learning uh, field, it's still very, uh, like maybe in the whole conference, there is uh, uh, two papers about uh, um, machine learning for neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe four papers. Four papers about machine learning for neuroscience, uh, two papers about uh, quantum computing, but all the rest, 
it's all about large language model and reinforcement learning and in a very system centered approach. So yes, I, I think the, the the difficulty that I face is in this kind of field, like machine learning, it's uh, difficult, uh, especially in a woman who does uh, artwork. <laughs> like when you have to introduce yourself to a machine learning a Q uh, engineer, it's uh, a bit difficult. And uh, but there is some progress. Uh, there is the Women in Machine Learning uh, uh, Association, and they form the part of my research. It's, it's them who allow me to to go to ICML, and um, yeah, so there there is some progress on this. Yeah, I think it's about being being passive as a uh, doing serious um, serious research in machine learning is uh, probably there. Yeah. So several interesting things and useful, I think, for our listeners. First, that for those who are coming from art background and may not have an extensive knowledge about math, yes, that they still have many opportunities to develop themselves in uh, technologies, in math, and combine it with art. Because you provided your example that when you came uh, to the university, you were not very familiar with logarithms, yes? Nevertheless, now you are a wonderful expert in general machine learning application to BCIs, to technology. So I think it's a wonderful example that provides hope and opportunities for those who want to join the field from the arts. Yes, and the woman as well. So it's not just the field for men. Well, women have the same opportunity. And we need more women in our machine learning research. Like honestly, the is you know conference are very yeah the women are they're not a lot <laughs> Uh, yes. So, uh, and again, it's an uh, opportunity for our listeners, if they're listening, if they're women and may, may not be familiar with the technology, with mass, that it's possible. And there is a, a whole society a group, yes, for machine learning for women, where they can find information and I'm sure support and whatnot. So that is one very important thing. Also, the choice of the conference. For example, if there are some conferences where maybe this type of submissions of interdisciplinary research are not received very often or, you know, they might be looked upon not very seriously, there are conferences on human-computer interaction, yes, HCI conferences, where that would be a possibility to present your work and get the feedback and find like-minded people, yes? So that is another thing. And uh, the third thing that I noticed through your whole career, you are actually go against, in a way, maybe not purposely, you are not doing it purposely, but it's inner calling, you go against a certain stigma, certain social pressure, social limitations, yes, of how people should be perceived against the categories, you know, are you an art or are you in science? So you're saying, I'm both, yes, and we can be both. So it goes through all your career, starting from school. So what motivates you to still pursue your inner calling and your understanding that this is how I think things should be, that I would like to pursue this path, even there is all this social pressures and uh, opinions and whatnot. What helps you with that? Very simply, I think I pursue what that's what uh, make me happy, like, <laughs> basically, uh, because doing this kind of art and science project, when I make artwork, but when I also write uh, about this, because I really love to write, like, this is really something uh, I enjoy very much. Um, it, it, it just gives me joy to, to do this. So this is a... Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. This is not a very deep uh, reason, but this is an important motivation. When I when I write, I really enjoy writing, find the the good word for for it. When I am 
manipulating material uh, because I also work uh, quite a lot with uh, textile or silicone, like very tangible material, um, but still interactive. When I when I touch it, when I manipulate, I really enjoy it. Like this is a pure uh, self-centered uh, reward <laughs> thing. Um, but there is another thing. Um, I also noticed, uh, especially when last year, uh, there is a, my mask especially got a bit uh, by noticing the media. Um, um, I noticed that when I make what I like, People actually like it. <laughs> not uh, maybe not everybody. I don't uh, want to, to that everybody like my my work. But I receive some uh, good uh, good feedback uh, from people. And when I what I particularly like in a exhibition is when uh, I talk with people who ask me questions about my work and we we discuss. Uh, um, you yeah, know, just art and science, but I, I really like uh, the feedback from people. And for for example, something that happened uh, very recently when I I was um, I arrived in in Cambridge. Uh, so one year ago, I composed um, a love song uh, in French with uh, with uh, machine learning models as part of the AI song contest. But this is just a project I started. Uh, in my bedroom, I just <laughs> I recorded the, the song, and um, and I was contacted uh, one month ago by a student from Berkeley College of Music, so here in Boston, and she told me that they are studying my song in their class because <laughs> they, they they have a course called uh, Machine Learning for Musicians in Berkeley College of Music, so I. I it's a very interdisciplinary uh, uh, program that uh, she she is uh, in, enrolled, and yeah, she she wanted to since I was in Cambridge, she wanted to 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 meet me and she showed me uh, she did a presentation about my work. Like this was uh, quite moving for me to see that like people contact me and we interact, and she's a very talented uh, also music performer and. Like um, yeah, meeting a, uh, I think meeting an inspirational person, and also uh, this girl is younger than me, and uh, and uh, she's also very talented. And this, uh, I'm happy to see that it's my work also inspired other people because she composed a song using the, the same technique that I use in my song, which has motivated me. Uh, yeah, people and my, my my own desire, very personal and self-centered, but also uh, the feedback I, I got from from others uh, at the end of my brainwave music performance. There are people who who come to talk with me, uh, not just to 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 con congratulate me, but uh, some were very just moved by by the performance, or they wanted to to know how it worked, uh, things like that. Motivate. Yes, and I think uh, you, you touched upon a very important subject because sometimes people are afraid that when they're thinking about themselves, about feeling happy of doing certain things, they think about this as selfish, being selfish, and that's why they're afraid to do it. But what you are saying that feeling doing what makes you happy actually produces a very good results. So it's not about what is the motivation, it's about the result that it creates. If your motivation of being happy when doing things create this wonderful results that interest other people, that bring new knowledge, new experiences, a new even view on, on this world, uh, new interactions between art, science, uh, and technology, then it is a very important motivation. We cannot call it selfish or not selfish. Yes, it's just something, uh, basically a tool for you to produce all these wonderful things. Yeah, totally. Yeah. 
So uh, I'm very glad that you mentioned this uh, because I think it can help many other people uh, to get rid of that feeling of, you know, guilt or something because they think they should be doing something that is already structured, that is approved, but may not bring them really joy of what they are doing. Uh, so it's not for everyone, but I think it's important to mention that this might be important to listen to yourself and think what motivates you and help you to uh, do beautiful things that, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, and maybe as we're nearing the end of our podcast and you mentioned your performance, BCI for music performance, can you maybe bring our listeners into this installation? So maybe you can guide us as we would enter whatever it is you can describe and what we would experience if we would come to this installation. So when you will enter the, the room, I will be, uh, <laughs> I will be sitting cross-legged on the floor in the middle of the... I perform mostly in, in conference setting, academic setting, but um, it could be uh, anywhere else. Um, wearing my, I like to call it my amplifying feeling mask. So this is the, the mask I made from this one Chanel uh, EEG, uh, Sonsa Embedded. It's 3D printed, like uh, looking like a mascara uh, mask, white with uh, embedded uh, optic fibers. Uh, that change color uh, with the the performance uh, and uh, and so at the beginning of the the performance, I um, you can hear a little uh, it it's called a ting 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 sa bells. I'm not sure if I pronounce it well. It's like a bell the uh, used for. Uh, a ceremony or like a ritual, a bit meditative, um, I think in Asia. Um, this is controlled by my bling. So I'm just sitting cross leg and with my bling, you see my bling, you hear the thing. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the, in total, it's, it's a 10 minutes music piece. Uh, controlled mostly by brainwave, even though they are like also blink. But this is the blink they use from from brainwave or so. But and at the beginning of the performance, I I composed it so that uh, I predicted that I would be nervous <laughs> about going on stage starting my performance. So um, I learned to modulate. I would say the the um, the level of my beta bond in uh, especially because I I managed to find a method that works on me is purely empirical I have not uh, done really a, an experiment in lab for that but I noticed that when I think a lot about uh, like judgmental thoughts I managed to increase the my beta bond. I can start to, but this is in my head. I, I don't uh, tell it uh, I don't work any, but I, I start to, it's not very healthy, but I try to make me anxious, I would say, <laughs> to amplify this feeling uh, at the beginning of the performance and uh, the beta level, both the high and, uh, and low beta level control uh, different symbols. So the, the the level of the beta control the volume of the symbols and once it reach uh, threshold there is a drum roll. <laughs> this is at the beginning of the performance. Um, yeah, so mostly playing on the beta beta bond, and then uh, the um, second part is um, controlled mostly with the alpha bond. So I try to, I manage to increase the level of alpha just by closing my eyes and uh, start to meditation. Uh, basically, I, I breathe, I start to have an empty mind without a very calm uh, resting state. And um, 
the level of the alpha control different string instruments, uh, like drony uh, instrument. This is really some kind of neurofeedback. I I meditate, I hear the music, and I, I hear the the drone that modulates as much uh, as long as I breathe. And uh, I do uh, feel that I really managed to master some kind of control of that. Like I really, I hear the drone and, uh, and it's quite intense, I think, uh, when, I, when I do this. And um, the more I meditate, uh, the more um, there is a proprietary uh, algorithm in your sky that computes the meditation value which is a mixture of the alpha and beta and beta. But there is a, an equation for that. And uh, once I reach a specific threshold of meditation, it triggers some gamelan samples. A Japanese uh, gamelan is a, it's a Japanese instrument that plays. And uh, basically all the performance is, is composed with multiple instruments that are controlled by the the brain on the power spectral density band, but I mostly use the alpha and beta because those are the one I managed to intentionally control it. I, I wanted to, to add like gamma control because gamma is also known for meditation, but I'm not yet a uh, meditation <laughs> expert. I, I don't know how to control my gamma nor the delta or beta there. Um, but uh, at the end of the performance, I, I start to sing in several languages, depending on the country. I sing in Polish the first time, uh, last time uh, in English, I think, when I was in the uh, Dutch Museum, because I don't speak German. <laughs> and this is more a freestyle part of the performance, because I no longer try to induce or control my or spectral uh, density, but uh, instead I just I still try to induce emotion with the, the voice, the singing, but just uh, let it uh, let it happen, and and then the mask uh, change color depending on the what is the the depending on the peak in different uh, uh, PSD, so it just change color with the most dominant uh, frequency band. And in the latest version of my performance, I also trained a model to make a deep fake of my singing voice. So at the end of the performance, there are also clones of my voice <laughs> that, uh, that are overlaid on, on my voice. Um, so it sounds like that, and you're singing, and uh, the, the light blinking on the mask and the, the music modulated, also the, the percussion come back also with the beta and, and, um, and voila, this is my performance. <laughs> yeah, a very interesting experience where people can listen to you or, or, or not even listen, experience this. Um, I'm looking for venues to perform it again next year. I don't know yet when I will perform it again, but um, the, I, I have some ideas actually, but I, I can't tell since it's not uh, it's still a negotiation now, but um, but for sure I will update you on my upcoming uh, performance. Otherwise, on, on my uh, website, there, there is um, a page on, on this uh, music performance with uh, the most photos, but I, w I will add the... Um, I will have video soon. Ah, and the news is that uh, next year I'm so I, I just started a collaboration with a, a talented videographer uh, named uh, Maureen Castera, and we will record a music clip next year um, with uh, the brainwave music and also this mask, as well as a, a costume that goes with the mask. Uh, based on biosignal also. So, yes, uh, I'm very, like, she, we started the storyboard. She is really, she draws uh, all the storyboard. It's, it's very beautiful. Next year, uh, yes, I will publish this video. We have not recorded yet. We are just at the storyboard. But, uh, yes, 
Mm-hmm. Yes, exciting news. And uh, we will provide uh, the link to your website for our listeners uh, so that they can follow up and see where they can hear you and uh, also your contact information so that maybe somebody wants to propose you to perform somewhere uh, and uh, provide this opportunity for people. Yes, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, okay. Uh, So as we are almost at the end of our podcast, one thing I I wanted to ask you about is you working as an independent researcher. So this is what you mentioned. Uh, Can you describe a little bit uh, what what it is and why I am asking? Because I think it is related to what we talked about, that sometimes you need to carve your own path. Yes. So I think these are two topics that are related. And this is for those who also may need to carve their own path. So can you talk a little bit about that? What, yeah, what it is? But working as an independent researcher means that I am not employed by uh, a company or a startup to, to make my research. I just pursue uh, this uh, on my own. Um, even though uh, this year I created a sort of a structure, a research studio with one of my, my friends, and we published uh, two papers together on, um, on the generative AI uh, at work. Um, it's called uh, Latent Organism, and my, my co-worker is uh, Adrien Stassi. Um but most of the time, uh, yes, I, I publish, uh, I publish several paper, uh, several paper as the sole author, <laughs> uh, which, uh, I learned at the world that it's quite unusual to be, uh, writing papers in your garage or <laughs> I feel like, um, um, a bit like a self supervised, uh, PhD student because <laughs> I, I don't have a PhD uh, yet. And I just, uh, I make project on my own, mostly artwork, but, um, recently I, I made, uh, an ex, uh, machine learning experiment on, uh, with diffusion model on music, music surprisal, surprisal in reaction to music. It was accepted to NERIPS workshop. So very soon I will, I will be at uh, NERIPS. Yeah. So. Independent research is really, uh, you work in, <laughs> it's a tautology, you work independently and uh, for, for my part, I do art work. I write articles about this. Of course, independent research involves uh, uh, fundings and this is a, a very important part of independent research. So I spend... Um, an extensive uh, part of my, my time applying for grants for, um, I got the funding from women, machine learning. Um, I don't know if I can get all the, the funding, but I got invited, uh, recent in a few weeks, I'm going to California, invited by a uh, meta reality lab to a workshop on uh, augmented reality. My uh, research implies a lot of um, application <laughs> all the time to grants, and um, this is uh, yeah, the the biggest difference with uh, standard. I mean, you you apply to grant too, but uh, it's a more secure way of working when you're not independent. But the advantage of being independent researcher is you you can really write on any topic you want. <laughs> I, I, uh, at ICML, I write a sort of um, artistic manifesto that was accepted in, in a workshop uh, talking about my vision of human AI um, interaction. And I'm, I'm the sole author, so I just <laughs> enjoy writing my papers. Yeah, the, the only, only thing is really finding a, a way to present the paper in person 
yeah, what else can I tell about the pandemic? Uh, yeah, yes, I think what you said is very important. Um, uh, actually, I have people contacting me and uh, uh, talking about certain areas that they see that they started to develop that are not really developed yet. And they're asking about this. Can I publish? Can I publish on my own? Uh, will my article be accepted? Um, what uh, affiliation should I use as independent researcher? So how would you answer those questions? Uh, how do you feel publishing on your own? How is it perceived? How is it uh, reviewed? How is it accepted? What is your experience? I said that I, I often feel like an alien, especially in machine learning conference. It's very unusual to be the solo told the paper. Uh, <laughs> you just did I didn't it. know about that yes. first, so I just, <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But but I felt quite like a, like an outlier on a CR, and uh, I saw at the the conference, and that also relates to what we were saying earlier. I don't know if it's necessarily linked to to my my gender, but uh, for example, when I got this paper accepted at um, ICML workshop, uh, I've been told that uh, I've been quite devaluated by male. Uh, person, I won't tell who, but uh, there are some people who told me, you know, this, your work has no value and this is not, uh, it's just a workshop. Uh, of course, acceptance raising is way easier to be accepted at a workshop, but I've been told that it has no value and it's very easy to, to write a paper for ICML, a workshop. Uh, and since those persons were older than me, there was there was some kind of authority, and I <laughs> yes, I could fall for this kind of uh, uh, so. But uh, I didn't listen to that. Uh, I also been told I should not go to present my paper because um, it was in United States in the middle of summer, um, uh, last minute acceptance. So yeah, it implies a lot of cost. It was very. Uh, something uh, to go to ACML, but I did it and I really don't regret it because the opportunities that I got there, the people that I met, I found collaborators, uh, the fact that I am here in Cambridge right now, it's also a consequence of my uh, visit at ACML. I never got a paper really rejected. And right now I have a paper on uh, that is a uh, on the submission. So each time that I got a paper accepted, uh, the first one uh, was uh, the first one on my own. I mean, um, because I published when I was working at a company, but the first one on my own was at Pay Conference. Um, it was the art track, actually. So it was a paper about my proposal of runway music performance. So I got accepted. Of course, I was very happy, even if I, I didn't uh, expect it. And each time I got the paper accepted to a conference, I try to submit the paper to um, a conference that is uh, more difficult to be accepted, I would say. So each time I try a more difficult, even if it's workshop, so after today, I've done CHI, then I've done uh, ICML, and now I got the paper at New Reefs workshop, but also uh, the creative AI track I will have a, a booth at Nerips on my own. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I didn't uh, see it coming, honestly. Yeah, always I always try to push the limit, uh, push my own uh, my own fear. I start to to get more confidence, and uh, I don't fear to to be rejected, honestly, because. What I value the most is the, the review of people, and I just see this as an opportunity to revise my paper and to maybe submit it to another venue. Affiliation is not very clear because uh, I often use sometimes uh, maybe the not the, okay. no, no. <laughs> the right affiliation <laughs> because, yes, as an independent researcher, uh, maybe I should not use always the 
affiliation that I used. Uh, sometimes I use uh, email version of the email. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes the previous university or something like that, uh, even if I'm no longer a student there. But I, I never got any issue with, with this. Um, no, I think it's just when you introduce yourself to someone, um, it can uh, surprise. I've been told a lot that I, by my previous employer, that I should do a PhD, but now I'm just taking the the, the time to to find the right place where I want to, to do it. Because there is this pressure of like you can't be a real researcher or, or uh, you can't be a research scientist without a PhD. While to some extent I I agree because to be trained as a researcher or especially the publishing the paper part uh, the re how to run an experiment you have like uh, an experience in industrial academia is very relevant and this is how I learned to write paper because first I work in companies where I I got uh, paper accepted too no well, I think I, I I start to develop uh, yes self confidence in my writing. I know a bit. Uh, I develop a method that seemed to to work because I I study the topic of the the track where I want to submit. I I look at the, who organized this. Uh, if it's a workshop, uh, I read the literature, uh, the relevant literature, and I. And so far, yes, I always had my my paper accepted. So. Thank you, thank you. And uh, again, very useful suggestions and how to start and then push the limit, uh, go to a more advanced and more advanced conference or a workshop. And again, not to be afraid of whatever stigma it is, whatever people might be thinking and succeeding. And maybe that um, something I found very um useful when you want to join a, a research community that you're not familiar with uh, and what by joining i said maybe publishing a paper in a specific conference take for example uh, yes machine learning for news or even uh, my first publication when i was in industry it's always useful to attend the conference that where you want to publish at least once uh, before so that you learn uh, which kind of paper, what, which vocabulary they use, what are the, the expectations of the, the conference. Because this is, for almost all my publications, this is how, how I did it. I, I attend the conference once without publishing there or, uh, or just having a, a workshop paper there so that you, you, you get a, a sense of, uh, yeah, how, wh which kind of paper is accepted there? And then the next year, I got the paper in the the main track accepted there. My track. So, yeah, even if it's a field you you're not familiar. So yes, I have been to ICML without uh, just because I want to get more involved in the field and uh, I learn uh, yes what are the type of paper accepted there. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Great approach. I 100% uh, agree with it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much uh, for all this wealth of information and sharing your experience, uh, encouraging our listeners who might be creating their own path, yes, carving their own path in interdisciplinary field. So thank you very much. Of course, um, uh, my best wishes uh, to you, to all your work. And uh, I hope to see you in our podcast, maybe, you know, two and, or maybe five years from now, uh, when we already will start seeing uh, this amazing merge between technologies and arts getting stronger and stronger. So uh, I'm very curious to see that. And before we end our podcast, would you like to say anything to our listeners? Uh, maybe give them advice, share anything, anything you want. Yes, I really hope that if there are listeners interested in art and science, they should know that there is a, 
really no no fear to have to to dare uh, take the risk to to build your own uh, your own path because if you don't recognize yourself in the existing academic proposal uh, uh, really just create your own then of course there will be the funding issue but the like so far it's been one year I applied to grant and like even from a not very wealthy background you can succeed in just building your your own path and uh, yes I will I would also be happy uh, to if there are people who who want to I don't know uh, have some uh, advice or mentoring or something like feel free to to contact me uh, if you have any questions about my work or see if you if there is any venue that want to host my brainwave music performance um I will also be happy come yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Nino. It was a great pleasure to have you on our podcast. And uh, yeah, looking forward to, to your updates on the amazing work you do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina. Dear Neuro Careers podcast listeners, thank you for joining us on this incredible journey into the entrepreneurial world of neuroscience and neurotechnologies. I hope you've been inspired by the stories of those who are turning groundbreaking ideas into impactful realities. If you are looking for more guidance on succeeding in neuro careers, book a free consultation with me, your podcast host, Dr. K, at the Institute of Neuro Approaches. So, what are you waiting for? Let's navigate the path to success in the world of neuro careers and make the impossible possible together.